Who likes birthdays? Me too. Birthdays are pretty cool, eh? Who likes birthday cakes? Yeah, birthday cakes are great. Uh, what, what do we put on birthday cakes? I, uh, true, yeah, icing. What else? Candles, that's right. And uh, if you're turning 87, how many candles do you get? That'd be pretty cool, eh? 87. I mean, normally at that stage, they just give you one. And it's pretty hard to blow them out because you're 87. You're like... And that's about all that comes out. I mean, I'm not sure. This is me assuming because I'm not 87 yet. Close, but not 87 yet. But you get a candle, right? And then your cake turns up. And when the cake's there, you've got the candle on it. But before you blow it out, what do people say sometimes? True. But yeah, very true. They have birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, okay, cool. Then after that, what do they say? Before you blow the candles out, make sure you make a... Wish. That's right. And it always comes true, right? But, what? yeah, of course it does. Well, oh, they always come true. Wishes always come true, right? Like, But I was always told that as long as I don't tell anyone, because you're not allowed to tell anyone, eh? Because apparently for some reason if you tell someone the wish doesn't come true, go figure. So you get the cake, there's the candle, and they always said to me, make a wish, and then blow out the candle, and then it'll come true. Does that not work? It doesn't work. What about when you see a flying or a shooting star? Then you make a wish and it comes true, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, no. Oh. Oh. Um, what, about, what, about if you, what about if you walk under a ladder? Apparently, that's real bad luck. So if you walk under a, under a ladder, it's bad luck. So you better make a wish to correct it, right? Oh, what about if you break a mirror? Well, you'll probably get in trouble. But it's, 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 apparently it's bad luck. So wishes don't work. So when the Bible says that we need to hope for something, do you think that's the same thing as wishing? Mm, probably not. Yeah, not sure. Because the Bible says have hope of eternal life. Put your hope in eternal life. Do you think that's like going... I wish that I have eternal life. No. no. No, it's quite different. You see, when the Bible talks about hope, it's not talking about making a wish or wishing something would come through. I really hope it comes true. But it's holding on to something and knowing it is true. It's hope that expects it to come true. And that's a really wonderful reminder for us because when the Bible tells us to hope for something, the reason it tells us is because it's going to happen. So unlike blowing out your candles and making some weird pretend wish, you can hold on to the hope and know it will take place. And that gives us comfort, doesn't it? Because it means we can believe what the Bible says. So let's pray and thank God that we can have hope that's true and we'll ask him to bless us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have given us a sure and a certain hope. And we pray that, Lord, you would help us to lay hold of all of the promises in the Bible, not with wishful thinking, but with hope that lasts forever. And we ask that, Lord, these children, these children would believe all that you tell them to be true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible with you this morning, we're turning through to the book of Titus. For those who are visitors, we've just began a series in the book of Titus where we are going to slowly walk through the book and mine it for some of its gold. Titus, we're going to pick up in chapter 1. Last week we looked at verse 1 in the morning and the evening. This morning we're going to look at verse 2 and then tonight we'll be in verse 3. <clears throat> but in order to put it in its uh, just wider context, we'll read the first four verses of Titus chapter 1. This is God's holy and inerrant word for you today. Paul a servant of God, and an apostle of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the faith of God's elect 
and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And at the proper time, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us, and before we come to consider it, let us pray. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you that you have given us your word and that when your word is preached, we hear the word of Christ. And so this morning, Lord, we ask that you would speak to your people, that Lord, as as we sit under the preaching of your word, we would hear we would hear the accent of Christ that the preacher would be forgotten but we would leave with the words of Christ ringing in our ears lord attend your word in jesus name we pray amen Hope, hope, hope is a very powerful thing. I remember listening to a series of lectures by Richard Winter, who's a psychologist and counsellor, where he said that at the end of the day, counselling, doing psychology work is really just enabling a person to come in and have more hope than they had before they came. And that every counselling session, you are just aiming to give them a little bit more hope. Hope makes a big difference in your life, doesn't it, when you have hope? I don't know if you've ever been in a really hard situation, whether it's sickness, relationship breakdown, any number of different things. You know, when when there's no light at the end of the tunnel, when it feels hopeless, it's really hard to get up in the morning, isn't it? It's really hard to face the battle. But when you know and you have hope, when you can see the light at the end, all of a sudden, everything changes, right? Everything changes. And yet everything's still the same. It's strange, isn't it? You know, your situation doesn't change. And yet, now that you have hope, everything feels different. I I think of times when I've sat with couples who who are struggling in their marriage. And and they just feel like there's no way ahead. And, and you have one conversation and you talk through a few things and, and everything feels different to them because they look at the situation and they think, oh, wait, there's hope that we can get through this. Hope, brothers and sisters, it's very, very powerful. And the same is true for the Apostle Paul. You've got to remember the context of the Apostle Paul. So, so Titus is written between 1st and 2nd Timothy. It's written at a period of time where Paul has already been arrested and he's already been in Rome, and we think he's probably gotten off the charges, and he's then gone up towards Spain, and he's preached the gospel there. And in between Titus and 2nd Timothy, he's going to get arrested again and taken back to Rome, and under the persecution of Nero, he's going to die for his faith. But as he's writing this letter, he's writing it as a man with scars upon his back, right? He's writing it as a man who has been beaten, mistreated, maligned, 
hated, rejected, and despised. He writes this as a man who will have to say, everyone has left me except Luke. He writes this as a man who remembers Demas abandoning the faith. He writes this as a man who will say Hymenius has made a shipwreck of his faith. Fellow workers who have rejected the gospel of Christ. And yet he says, in hope. Last Sunday night, we looked at the core values of Paul's ministry and how how he labors to see the church, God's elect, brought in by faith and knowledge of the truth, verse 1, which produces godliness in them. And yet in that context, could you imagine Paul looking around at all of those that have rejected it, all of those that have mistreated him for the gospel, all of those who have hated him? Could you imagine him just going, there's no point. Why do I bother? Why do I labor? Why do I even bother living in this thing? It just goes horribly. And yet Paul can say, in a nutshell, I labor and I live in hope. And the reason he says that is because Titus needs that same hope as he ministers to the people in Crete, a people who are described as being always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons in verse 12. Not a particularly easy context to do ministry in, is it? And yet Paul also says it because he knows The Cretan church needs hope. Hope. Biblical hope. Paul speaks for himself. I have hope in ministry. But he also speaks of the effect of the gospel. So he has hope about the gospel going out and doing it. But he also has hope in himself. And so I want us to consider this hope. And we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the object of hope the foundation of hope, and also the assurance of hope. So firstly, the object of hope. You know, hope is hope because it looks to something, right? You don't, you don't have hope in nothing, do you? If someone says to you, what, what have you got hope about? You don't go, well, I'm hoping in nothing. So I, I'm, well, you might do that because you're in a really bad state. But generally speaking, I hope in X. Well, Paul says in verse 2, in hope of, I have hope of eternal life. I have hope of eternal life. So I'm laboring in the gospel and my hope for the people receiving the gospel and my hope for myself is eternal life. Eternal life. It's a phrase we use quite often, isn't it? It's in pop songs, it's in books. It's in movies, living forever. What is eternal life? What answers do you think you'd get if you walked down Manurewa this afternoon and, and every person you bumped into, you walked up to them and said to you, can I ask you a question? How would you define eternal life? How would you define heaven? How would you define paradise? What sort of answers would you get? You can imagine, right? Happiness with my family. No sickness. Never dying. No more conflict. No more work. No more nappies. No more thorns and thistles. No more weeds in the garden. Never aging, never having to say goodbye to those I love. How would you answer if someone came up to you and said, What's eternal life? How would you answer that question? Because we talk about it, right? We talk about wanting it. What is it? 
If Paul is saying his hope is of eternal life, well, what, is it, what does it mean to have eternal life? We can answer it from the negative. So in 2 Thessalonians, if you just skip back a couple of pages, in 2 Thessalonians verse, chapter 1, verse 9, here's the opposite of eternal life. They, being those under the judgment of God, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, note this, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So Paul would say the opposite of eternal life is being away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So there's, there's, there's something about presence in it, right? And if you have a look at John, Jesus gives us a beautiful description. John chapter 17, verse 3, which says, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, According to Jesus in this prayer, eternal life is knowing God, not knowing about God, but knowing God, having a relationship with God, and having a relationship with God and Jesus whom he sends. But I think my, my favorite place to go is one that's probably very familiar to all of you, and it's the thief upon the cross. You remember those words when the thief says to Jesus, remember me in your kingdom? And what's Jesus' answer? Do you, have you ever noticed that it's not, I tell you the truth, you will live forever. But he says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. He doesn't say today you will be in paradise. He says today you will be with me in paradise. You see, eternal life is bound up in relationship with our triune God. Or to say it differently, there is no eternal life without God in the picture. You, you can test you can test your understanding on this by asking yourself this question. If I could go to heaven and live forever and, and, and you know never get sick, never have to change nappies again, never have to work again, everything's just everything I could ever desire, fancy car, whatever it is that floats your boat, just all of it. But Jesus is not there. Would you be content? Because I dare say that often we fall into an understanding of eternal life, which is defined as me getting what I want when I finally get to heaven. But that's not eternal life. Eternal life is finally obtaining what our soul truly longs for. And so the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us, eternity is bound up in the heart of man. Why is eternity bound up in the heart of man? Not because by nature we feel like living for a long time, but because we've been created as image bearers of God to find our rest in God. So that, as Augustine would say, we don't have rest, we're we're constantly in a state of friction until we find our rest in Him. You see, it's not enough to just live forever, brothers and sisters. We, we need, with the, the writer of Song of Songs, to be able to, to look to God and say, Oh, Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Delight in me. 
It needs to be the longing of our heart that like in Zephaniah 3, that God would say, I rejoice over you. I am in your midst. Why do you think in Revelation 21, the high point is not that there's a glorious city. The high point is there's no temple because God is in their midst. The brothers, the gift of eternal life, sisters, the thing you're looking forward to is not that you won't get old, though that be true, but that forever you will look upon the face of Christ and never, ever will there be a separation between you and him as there is now. Doesn't it grieve you? That again and again, you turn to other idols. And don't you just long that your heart would be devoted to him and that you would delight in him and no other? Oh, that's coming. You see, Christ didn't just come to set us free from our sin. He came to buy us for himself so that we could delight in him. And he could delight in us. Is that what you look forward to, brothers and sisters? Is that what you live for? You see, this is what it means for Paul to say in Colossians 3. Set your mind on heavenly things. It's not set your mind on some mystical spiritual place in the sky. Let's set your mind upon Christ, who is in you, the hope of glory. Look to Him. Do you live with a devotion to Him? That's what this is calling us to. That's what hope calls us to. We hope in having Him. You see, Paul labors because his hope is not a wishful thinking, but a firm and expected hope that he and those that hear his gospel would have Christ. However, however, hope by itself really is just wishful thinking. Let me say that again. Hope by itself is just wishful thinking. Hope is not hope, not biblical hope, unless it has a biblical foundation to stand upon. This is why blowing out candles on a birthday cake gives you no hope of anything taking place, right? Because you don't have anything to pin it on. It doesn't matter how hard you wish, Or how much you believe, because you have no foundation with which to expect it to come true. And the same is true of our biblical hope. And so biblical hope must be based upon a foundation. So notice the foundation of hope. The... um, This week, while I was preparing, I stumbled across this thing called the Hope Research Project. You find all sorts of weird things when you research stuff. So I stumbled across this university in Oklahoma, and they, for about the last, I think it was about 16 years, they've been researching hope. It might sound weird. How does one research hope? But apparently they research hope. And their goal is to try and see how they can use hope to help people. And to change people, especially those who have suffered, you know, domestic abuse victims, addicts. How can we use hope to enable these people to change? It's a great initiative, right? Great thing to do. And and right at the top of their website is their definition of hope. And they say, hope is the belief that the future will be better. And you have the power to make it so. Hope is based on three main ideas. 
pathways to goal attainment and willpower, sorry, desirable goals, number one, pathways to goal attainment, number two, and willpower to pursue those pathways. Now, I wonder if you spot the problem in this definition of hope. Hope is the belief that the future will be better. Based on what? I mean, humanistically speaking, it's pretty easy to look around the world and think it doesn't look like it's getting much better. In fact, it feels like it's getting much worse. But human hope, at the end of the day, that's all you have. Wishful thinking, right? But that's not how the Lord leaves us. We're not like the child blowing out candles. Or, or to use a different analogy, we're, we're not like the girl who hopes the boy will marry her, but he hasn't given her a ring yet. Can you imagine that situation? I mean, some of you ladies probably can remember that. There was a boy you had your eye on. Hopefully you're sitting next to him. There was a boy you had your eye on, and, and you thought to yourself, oh, I really hope I get to marry him one day. I thought that for about four years before I married Josella. But I didn't have any actual hope it would take place until I put a ring upon her finger. And then I had every reason to believe it would take place, right? Because I now had a foundation. I now had a sign and a seal that we were going to get married. I had, I didn't have the real thing yet, but I had a promise, didn't I? Isn't that what an engagement is? That's a promise to get married. And that's what we have with hope, brothers and sisters. We have a foundation, a promise-based foundation that we can bank our hope upon that never fails. So Paul says in chapter 1, Titus, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lives promised before the ages began. That word promised in the Greek is actually way up earlier in the sentence. It actually says, in hope of eternal life, which he promised. And it, it leaps off the page. And Paul brings it forward to emphasize it because they didn't have bolding and underlining in those days. And Greek doesn't have exclamation marks. So he brings it to the front, which he promised. Well, what has he promised, brothers and sisters? What is this solid rock that we can stand on? What is this promise? Because it could refer to, before the foundations of the world, it could refer to all of the Old Testament promises. It could refer to a specific promise. So what is it pointing to? And the answer is yes, all of those things. Paul is speaking of the eternal promise, the eternal decree that took place before the foundation of the world, what we call the covenant of redemption, when God himself would elect a people for his choosing. Remember, Paul says that he works for God's elect in verse 1. God chooses a people for himself. He sets his love upon them. God decides and promises to save these people. Their names are written in the book of life, in the Lamb's book. And he sets out upon a work to redeem them and purchase them and have them as his own special people, his own inheritance, his own heritage. And so, funnily enough, what's the very first thing we see after the fall? Is it not a promise? Genesis 
Oh, Eve, there is a day coming when one of your seeds will destroy the devil. And when we get to Genesis 49, and we get Jacob, Jacob blessing his children. Do you remember what he says to Judah? A scepter will be raised up from you to rule over the nations. And we get to 2 Samuel and David. And what does Jesus promise? What does the Lord promise? I will give you a kingdom that lasts forever. And when you get to Isaiah, what are we told? The virgin will give birth. And he shall be called Emmanuel. And again, the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him. To declare the year of the Lord's favor. Over and over and over again. This this promise that God would save his people. Brothers and sisters, that's what we bank our hope upon. It's like our wedding ring. It's like our engagement ring, I should say. That we look to and we say, I haven't got the wedding yet, but I have the promise that it's coming. He's promised eternal life. And so my hope is sure and firm and steady. It's the promise of Christ, isn't it? Do you remember 2 Corinthians? All of the promises are what? Yea and amen in Christ. And what does Hebrews say in Hebrews 8 to 10? We have a better covenant. We have a better high priest. We have a better promise because we have Christ. Our promise is not just a written promise. It is a promise that is rooted in the very person of Jesus. Because he lives, our hope is sure. What do we do? Upwards, I look and see him there. Brothers and sisters, Do you see him? Can you see him standing at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? If he's standing there, your salvation is secure. And he is. And your hope is sure. Because it rests upon the foundation of the solid rock. Jesus Christ himself. All other ground is sinking sand. But on this solid rock we stand, the blessed Redeemer, Jesus Christ, our King. You know, we can be like little children. Have you ever seen a little child with like a a McDonald's hamburger voucher? I mean, the, the, the courage and brashness of a child with a voucher. There's no doubt that they're not going to get their hamburger because they gave me a free McDonald's hamburger voucher. And they say to you, what? Mum, Dad, can we stop into McDonald's? I want to get my free hamburger. They don't say, I want to take it in and, and hopefully, you know, maybe I might get the hamburger. They're like, oh, no, I, I'm getting my hamburger. And they walk in and they go up with their voucher and they go, Excuse me, sir. Okay, they're probably not this bold. But excuse me, sir, I'd like my hamburger. And what does the man say? Oh, I don't feel like giving you a hamburger today. He says, oh, my little child, I see you have a free voucher. Take your hamburger and go. Brothers and sisters, We have the most glorious voucher upon the face of the planet, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, truly man and truly God. And we enter into the holy places by the blood of the eternal covenant. And we come in with Christ and we say, Father, I'm banking my hope on him. Isn't he wonderful? Why would you ever hope in anything else? 
what else would you rest upon? The research center, you can take your hope. We've got Jesus Christ. But notice, lastly, we have the object of hope, we have the foundation of hope, but we also have the assurance of hope. You see, there is another problem, and, and, and that is, it's, it's, it's pointless having hope that doesn't have a foundation, right? But, but a foundation is only as trustworthy as he who lays it, right? You think about some of the foundations that were tested during the Christchurch earthquake. Or to say it differently, the promise, which is the foundation, the promise is only as trustworthy as he who speaks it. And, and we know this, don't we? Why is it? Why is it that a wife struggles to trust? A husband who's been unfaithful. Because he's broken her trust. Because he's broken the promise, right? Why is it, parents, if, if you've ever had a child who's a chronic liar? I'm not dobbing any of my children in when I say that. So if you happen to have had a child that is a chronic liar... Why is it that every time your child says something, you instinctively think to yourself, are they telling the truth? Because their word is not sure. Their word is not trustworthy. But Paul says, Paul says in verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which he promised... If I translate it literally, in hope of eternal life, which he promised, the not lying God before the ages began. The not lying God. Paul actually makes up a word because there's not really a suitable Greek word to communicate what he's trying to say. And authors do this. So he just kind of makes up a word. He takes lying and just adds not on the beginning. Not lying God. How can we trust the promises that we receive? We can trust them because of the very character of God. Do you, do you remember that story in Numbers when, when the, there's the king Balak who hires Balaam to come and Balaam comes over and, and he's like, I need you to curse these people. And Balaam says, I can only say that which God tells me. And he blesses them and Balak gets angry and he blesses them. And it's over and over again. The second blessing he utters he says, God does not lie like a man. In other words, you can be sure, Balak, that what I'm about to say is emphatically true because God never lies. Brothers and sisters, we can say that about the promises of God. When God promises to save you, if you call upon him, it's true. Because not only does God not lie, he can't lie. It's against his character. It's impossible for God to do anything against his character. And so next time one of your children says to you, God can do everything right, you can say to them, no. Actually, he can't. Because he can't sin. He can't lie. He can't change. Why? Because God, question and answer four of the catechism, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Which means everything he says is true. Everything he says will come to pass. It means we can bank upon his promises. And, and this is repeated over and over. First Samuel 15, Samuel says to Saul, God doesn't change like you do, like a man. He has uttered it. It will not change. In Hebrews 6.18, we're told God doesn't lie. 
In 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, we're told God doesn't lie over and over again. Why? Because the assurance of our salvation banks upon it. You can be sure of your salvation because it's rooted in the very character of God. The only way your salvation can change is if God himself is not God. That's something you can bank on, right? It's a a little bit like, again, a child who goes to his his daddy and, and he says to his daddy... And and he's wringing his hands and and he's sort of looking down at the foot. You know that thing children do when they want to ask for something, but they're afraid they're going to get a no? He sort of looks down at the ground and he says, Dad, I was just wondering if, you know, maybe if it was okay that one day you could maybe buy me a bike. And his daddy looks at him and says, oh, my son, I'd love to do that. I'll, I'll buy you a bike. And, and the little boy looks up at his dad and says to him, do you promise? Uh, and the father smiles at him and says, I promise. You have my word. I will do it. And, and the little boy skips off singing, my daddy's going to buy me a bike. My daddy's going to buy me a bike. And he goes to school the next day. And what does he do? He goes to his friend and he says, I'm getting a new bike. And his friend says to him, how do you know you're getting a new bike? I asked my daddy. And daddy said, he's going to buy me a new bike. And his friend says to him, yeah, but how do you know he'll do it? And what does the little boy say? You don't know my daddy. My daddy never breaks a promise. Brothers and sisters, that's your God. Doesn't Jesus say, if your sinful fathers give you good gifts, how much more does your father in heaven? If your daddy delights to give you a bike and promise, how much more does your God in heaven give you that which he promises? Oh, brothers and sisters, believe the promise. Believe it. Are you strong in your faith and your assurance? Make your election sure, Paul says. Go on believing it. Do you doubt? Do you struggle with your assurance? Look to the promise of the Father. Are you an unbeliever here today? God promises to save you from your sins and give you himself for all eternity. And he does not lie. Believe in it. Hope changes everything, doesn't it? Hope gets you up in the morning. May hope do that for you and me. And may God be pleased to enable us to bank upon the promise of God and rest upon the foundation of God and to have hope of eternal life that he might be magnified as we trust in him. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a glorious promise you've given us. What a glorious hope that is sufficient for everything. That we need never doubt. That we can be wholly assured of everything you've promised in your word. Because it's come to us by the blood of the eternal covenant. Lord, sure up our faith. For we are weak. And help us to declare these promises, this hope.
to all around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.